Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Maybe you're Kevin Morgan. If you are, thank you. Or Paul Thiessen. Or Ali Sanjabi. Or brand new patrons that we got all last week. Larry, Erland, AI News, Brett, Isaiah, Eric, and Dinah. Welcome new patrons. Yeah. And also welcome to Justin Robert Young's new baby, Bella Young. Yay. On this episode of DTNS, why Telegram CEO was arrested in France, an NFC cloning attack, and is the Pixel 9 the end of trusting photos? This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 26th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Yeah, actually, you know, I only have photos that say Justin had a baby, Justin and Ashley. Um... Can we trust them? We'll find out mm-hmm. whether whether those babies are just AI or not. <laughs> uh, I don't think they are in this case, but we're going to talk about that. Let's start, however, with the quick hits. This is not a rumor. There's been a lot of rumors about Apple announcements, a lot of predictions. This is official. That's that's what we try to do on this show is tell you when the things are real. Apple sent out invites for an event at Steve Jobs Theater at Apple Park, 10 a.m. Pacific time. So that's 11, 12, 1, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Monday, September 9th. Wait, 10, 11, 12, 1 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> Monday, September 9th. So take that Tuesday rumors. Not a Tuesday. It's a Monday. Monday, September 9th. The tagline used on the invite is, It's glow time with a multicolored glowy version of the Apple logo. Let the overparsing of what that means begin. I hope it's a multicolored iPhone. It's <laughs> got to be, right? It's got to be the colors. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> IKEA told the Financial Times it is testing a secondhand market for its furniture in Oslo and Madrid with plans to roll out globally if it goes well. Customers upload the name, picture, and price of the item they want to sell, and IKEA's database adds promotional images and measurements. Buyers collect the items from the seller directly, and payments come through IKEA, which adds 15% if the seller takes the payment as store credit. Tencent's video game Black Myth Wukong sold 10 million copies in 83 hours, making it one of the fastest to reach that mark in video game history. PlayStation and PC game has reached a peak concurrent user count of 3 million as well, way up there, top in the Steam charts. The game is based on the classic take, uh, classic story Journey to the West. Uh, that involves the Monkey King and friends. It is the biggest hit to come out of Chinese publishers, and it's also in the good favor of the Chinese government, which had been cracking down on the game industry until late last year. State news agency Xinhua ran a documentary where it is described as expressing, quote, simple love for the nation. Aw. How cute. Reverse engineer Alessandro Paluzzi discovered that Threads has been developing disappearing posts, a temporary post, and all replies to it disappear after 24 hours. Since Paluzzi first discovered the feature in June's In June, Threads has added a timer so you can see how much longer the post will be up. No word on when this feature will be available to people not engaged in reverse engineering the Threads platform. (laughs) Uh, And Netherlands Privacy Agency has fined Uber 290 million euros for a violation of the EU's GDPR. The violations involve Uber sending data on Uber drivers to be stored in the United States without taking additional precautions to safeguard the data when it was being stored outside the EU. So to be clear, they didn't. this wasn't a leak. They weren't sharing it with third parties. They were just storing it on servers in the U.S. instead of in the EU. But those storage decisions were made during a time where a data sharing protocol between the EU and the U.S. had been struck down by a court in Europe but before a new agreement on the rules about sharing data had been reached. Uber is now in compliance because there's a new agreement. Uber claims it's not doing anything differently now than it was in that two-year period, and it plans to appeal the fine. All right, let's talk about what we actually know regarding Telegram's CEO. Pavel Durov was arrested in France Saturday evening. Uh, He had a private jet. Uh, landed near Paris, 
something he does all the time, so he probably wasn't expecting anything to happen. Uh, Durov's arrest is part of a preliminary investigation into whether Telegram's moderation policies have, quote, allowed criminal activity to go on undeterred on the messaging app. The arrest order was issued by Offman, O-F-M-I-N, a French agency for preventing violence against minors. Uh, Offman Secretary General Jean-Michel Benigold wrote, At the heart of this case is the lack of moderation and cooperation of the platform, which has almost one billion users, in particular in the fight against crimes against children. Now, more details of the arrest have not been issued, so we don't know the actual conditions or whether there are charges or what. Uh, but Agence France Press reports the investigation involves Telegram's role in, quote, drug trafficking, apology for terrorism, and cyberbullying. Um, before we start talking about this, a few other things to note. French President Emmanuel Macron has said that Durov's arrest was, quote, in no way a political decision. So he's saying this isn't us getting back at Telegram. This is an investigation for a crime and government isn't involved otherwise. Uh, Telegram posted to its official channel Sunday that it has nothing to hide, that it complies with the Digital Services Act, and it is not worried. Uh, it doesn't think it has done anything wrong. Uh, the other thing to note here is everybody thinks of Telegram as a secure messaging service, but it is not end-to-end -end encrypted by default. Uh, you have to go through a few hoops, and we'll, we'll talk about those, to have something encrypted. But most conversations on Telegram are not encrypted. It does not seem to be encryption that is at the heart of this arrest, but rather the fact that Telegram claims to be neutral and does very light moderation uh, and resists calls by governments to moderate conversations. So uh, before we, we get to more of the details, Shannon, you know, what's your first impression when you heard about this? This is a tricky one. The, fir the first thing I thought of when I was reading the article was like, okay, well, how does this compare to Signal? Like, why haven't we seen the same thing happen to Signal or WhatsApp? And it's, it's a, tricky situation for the CEO, but it, I think it's also tricky for users because it puts this idea in your mind of maybe we can't trust Telegram for our personal conversations, even though like obviously me and you are not involved with any of these kind of criminal activities. Yeah, it's, it is, I think Telegram suffers from a few things. Uh, first of which is its connection to Russia. So both the Russian and Ukrainian militaries are said to use Telegram to communicate with each other. Uh, Durov right. is Russian by birth, but he holds citizenship in France and the United Arab Emirates. Telegram moved its headquarters to the United Arab Emirates when Durov left Russia in 2014. So people describe it as fleeing Russia. He sold his stake in the Russian social network Vkontakte, which he helped found. Uh, and we don't know if he is, in fact, still a Russian citizen or if he has renounced his citizenship. However, the Russian embassy has said uh, they're trying to contact him. Uh, to offer support. Russian politicians have made public protests about this. So there's a lot of murkiness around the Russia of all of this. And there's a lot of murkiness about the encryption of all of this. Shannon, can you, can you explain what goes on with Telegram's encryption or lack of it? Yeah, absolutely. And just to mention, like we we're mentioning Russia here, but they also said that this is not a political statement. This is not a political yeah, right. move. It's just mm -hmm. about the rules. So like, is there anything there involved? Currently, we don't know. Like we need more information about that. But yes, in terms of Telegram's security, it does work very differently than how we have seen WhatsApp and Signal being set up. <clears throat> so Telegram offers encryption, but as you said, it's not on by default. You have to go into the settings and you have to know how to set it, up, set it up for each and every one of your different conversations. So if you want to have end to end encryption on Telegram, you have to turn on this thing called secret chats, which is found in your settings on every single one of those different conversations. And I also want to mention it's not available for group chats, which is pretty similar to a lot of other programs that you can currently use. Like if you just use Google Messages, and you're talking to people that are on different systems, you may not have access mm -hmm. to end-to-end -end encryption with that group chat. So you really have to have like everybody using the same app or on the same platform. <clears throat> so once so you turn on... 
Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Keep going. So once you turn on those secret chats, um, it's it's this multi-click operation. You have to go through several different settings to actually set it on. You have to do it more more than once. And it's not it's not as easy as it is whenever you download Signal and ask one of your friends to download Signal. Because when you do that, it's automatically end-to-end -end encrypted for both of you. When it comes to Telegram, you do have to set this up for yourself. And your friends also have to make sure that they have it set up too. So you do have to run into a lot of those like issues and have a little bit of a technical understanding of how to use end-to-end -end encryption before Telegram is going to work in your favor if you're trying to keep your conversations private. Yeah. And that secret chat is in a menu. It's not like yeah. there's a big old button that's obvious. If you don't know it's there, you won't know to turn it on. Right. Uh, if your friend is not online, you can't turn it on. You have to both exactly, be online yeah. at the same time. You both have to be on. That's very different from Signal or WhatsApp where yeah. it's just on. You don't have to do anything. Uh, yeah. So. I think that is probably a big part of this problem. So, you know, we're still trying to guess at this point what's actually going on. My first impression when I saw the headline was like, oh, great. We're going to do one of those like, I don't care if it's encrypted. You need to hand over the data. That's your problem situations. But I don't think that's what's going on here. What it sounds like is they want to go after people engaged in trading CSAM. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, explicit child imagery. Uh, Telegram has probably been less than cooperative saying, you give us a warrant, we'll do it, but we're not just going to go in and try to catch people otherwise because we have seen other companies try to walk that line. Apple was trying to do proactive filtering of CSAM images and came up with this very complex way of trying to do it on your device to balance your privacy with filtering for images it ended up not pleasing anyone and they didn't do it. Uh, right. So I, I wouldn't be shocked if Telegram was like, we're not even going to try. We're just not going to do it. And France saying, well, but you're not, those, those images aren't encrypted. So you have to do it. Uh, and there's a differing interpretation of the law there that's, that's causing this issue. Now, whether there's something involved with Russia or not, like you say, could be a side benefit where France is like, and then maybe we also get access to some Russian uh, communications. But I, I feel like that if it's involved in all would be a side effect, not the main cause here. It's a really, it's a very interesting conversation what's happening right now. And I, I have done several comparisons between Telegram and other encrypted applications that are out there. And this is not the first time that we have heard about Telegram specifically in the news because it's related to some kind of criminal activity, just as the platform that was founded to be involved. It, it was the platform that the criminals were using uh, to, to be able to invoke these criminal activities. So it's it almost doesn't come to me as a surprise that this is currently happening because I have seen Telegram pop up in like hacker and cybersecurity news so often. But this is uh, very interesting. And I'm I'm very curious to see how it turns out for the CEO, given that this could be a precedent for other similar applications, too. Yeah. And it's worth repeating, I think, to, to say this isn't Signal. This isn't end-to-end right. -end encrypted where you can have a conversation and no one but the people in the conversation know what happened uh, in it. Uh, this is Telegram where, yeah, it has a reputation for having shady users, even though it's not always end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, and, I, yeah. and again, I think, that's, I think that's what the issue is, is the government's like, well, most of your stuff isn't encrypted, so just hand it over. And Telegram is very you know, Pavel Durov is, is very idealistic and says, uh, no, I, I will not cooperate unless I have to. Uh, and that's probably causing a, a lot of the a lot of the uh, dispute here. It is quite a move to arrest the CEO of a company versus fining them or taking them to court. I agree. Yep. Uh, more on that as we find out what it is. Uh, let's talk about a Slovakian security company that has discovered some malware it's calling N-Gate, like the letter N. N-Gate relays contactless payment data from your credit and debit cards to the attacker-controlled device so they can clone your card. Uh, 
the attack requires you to be tricked into installing a malicious app. So your first line of defense is don't install that app. Uh, usually they'll try to fish you, though. They'll send you to a legitimate looking fraudulent banking website. And if you're not paying attention, you'll install this app. Uh, the fraudulent app then asks you to turn on NFC, tap your credit card against the phone in order to, you know, share your details with the banking app. Uh, and then that's how they get all of your credit card details and then can clone your card and make a tap card out of it. Uh, in fact, they even sometimes go to the lengths of calling you and telling you there's been a breach and instructing you to install a different malicious app uh, in order to cover their trail. Uh, they also can trick you into entering things like pins. So even if you have a debit card with a pin, if they trick you into entering your pin at some point, then they can clone the card and have the pin and then go withdraw a bunch of money from an ATM. Uh, Shannon, I... I you know, I, I almost feel like this is, you know, rinse and repeat, but uh, <laughs> it's the usual advice that you need to do to not fall for this. Uh, but remind us what the usual advice is. <laughs> well, th this is kind of cool for me because I, I do have a history. I used to have a like salaried position working at a bank and in installing credit card point of sale systems before I started doing YouTube. So it's it's like part, both parts of my um, adult career have like merged with this story. I think that's super fun just from a personal note. But yes, uh, one of the things is if you do want to use contactless credit card uh, tap and pay options, put your credit card on there and not a debit card because usually credit cards have more security precautions and more safety measures uh, than debit cards do. So if somebody steals money out of your, your bank account that's tied to a debit card, you might not be able to get that money back if it's fraudulent. But if you do have a credit card, credit cards have that kind of insurance tied into them. So they're usually able to pay you back if you submit a charge back. So that's one of the first things that you can do is just switch to a credit card if you're using a debit card. And second off, if you're really worried about this, don't use contactless payments at all. Like you, mm -hmm. you don't have to turn them on at all. You can leave your credit card. I have my credit card in my hand right now. I'm not going to show you, but you can just keep your credit cards in a um, really nice uh, safety device. Oh, what are they called? Faraday cage wallets. You can stick them all in a Faraday cage wallet and then people can't tap any of the um, connected options that are inside that wallet, including NFC, it'll be completely blocked off. And I've tested a few of those over over my lifetime. There's several good options on, for example, on Amazon. So it's really easy to find good Faraday uh, um, safety wallets. And also, if you're very worried about installing malicious apps, which you should be, uh, never install them outside of the legitimate Google Play Store or the Apple iOS Store. Like those are the main places where you can get applications that do have to go through some measures of authentication with those two major players in the industry. Now, yes, some apps do get through and still get put onto those application libraries and stores, even though they are malicious. But generally, that doesn't happen for most popular apps apps. So if you do want to download like a banking app, go to the Google Play Store or look at the back of your credit card to find the legitimate yeah. domain.com address and type it in. And then you can generally go to your bank's website by typing it in. Uh, don't Google it. There are such things as malicious bank websites that you can search and find on mm -hmm. Google's like first page. That's that's a, a common issue, especially with like prepaid cards. That's a big problem. Uh, so definitely like look at the legitimate sources like the back of your credit card to find the actual domains where you can download and find those Google Play and iOS Play Store apps. And remember that the uh, the Faraday cage wallet will not help if you take the credit card out of it and then <laughs> yes. tap the back of your phone to let the malicious app read That's it. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, there is a part of you that has to, to, to do something to stop this as well. Uh, and it's a great point about the the webs uh, or about the app stores. Uh, none of the end gate malicious apps are available in the official app stores. Mm -hmm. uh, they are they are side loads uh, only on Android at this point. They could be side loads on iOS in the EU uh, as well, although I don't think there's any of those out there yet. Uh, but that's uh, another good reason to make sure you know exactly what you're doing if you're not using the official app store. Folks, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? One way to let us know is our subreddit. Uh, you can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. 
Sarah Jung at The Verge has an article up this weekend called No One's Ready for This. Our basic assumptions about photos capturing reality are about to go up in smoke. Now, when I first saw the headline, my first reaction was, yeah, but everybody said that about photography. Like, oh, you can fake things. Uh, everyone said that about Photoshop. Uh, oh, you can put people into things easily with Photoshop in a way Stalin could have only dreamed of. Uh, but uh, Jung uh, addresses that. Uh, she writes, everyone who is reading this article in 2024 grew up in an era where a photograph was by default a representation of the truth. A staged scene with movie effects, a digital photo manipulation, or more recently a deep fake were potential deceptions to take into account, but they were outliers in the realm of possibility. It took specialized knowledge and specialized tools to sabotage the intuitive trust in a photograph. Fake was the exception, not the rule. So she's addressing that, saying, yeah, you could do Photoshop, but there were telltale signs, took a lot of work. Not everybody did it. If you were seeing somebody's picture from their phone, it was probably real in most cases. But the Pixel 9 is particularly what she's talking about in this article, makes it so easy to fake a photo that anyone can do it at scale. Uh, you don't have to take time. You don't have to learn Photoshop. Uh, and that changes the game. Uh, Shannon? Every time there's a new technology, people say, ah, but this time it's different. Is this time really different? <laughs> yes. But first, would you like to see my new kittens? I have. Wait, you kitten. got kittens? Yeah, I got a ton of kittens. Um, oh, they're really? Currently, yeah, they're sitting in my studio right now. Oh, uh, look at that. Yeah, don't they worry about They just sort them. of appeared they just yeah, <laughs> suspiciously they just, they, in the middle of your floor. <laughs> the mom cat has two tails, but just ignore that. I that didn't catch that at first. Okay, so <laughs> how did you make the kittens appear, Shannon? It is surprisingly easy. So I have been testing a Google Pixel 9 Pro XL or Pro 9 XL. I don't know. There's too many words in it these days. I've been testing one of those. Um, and it's so simple. You take a picture, you open up Google Photos, the application, and you choose the magic editor, which is a simple little icon. You draw a circle wherever you want to add an image into your, your photo that you just took. And then you type out what you want magic editor to generate and it gives you four different options and if you don't like those options you can choose oh generate more options and it'll give you even more options so you have lots of different options to choose from and you can choose the one that looks most realistic so i did this in my studio as you could see just an empty floor space and i was like i'm gonna trick my mom into thinking i got a litter of kittens why not okay and then i figured oh i could also do the same thing because I love tricking my mom. It's so much fun. I could uh, make her think that I'm just growing some a random thing of plants with some decorated rocks in the middle of my floor. and Right where the yes, kittens used to be. <laughs> right where the kittens used to be. <laughs> now, obviously, for us, we look at this and think something's off. Like, we're, mm -hmm. we're starting to understand when AI is coming into the picture. But if somebody just sent you a picture and said, I adopted a litter of kittens, like, you would think nothing less th of that. You wouldn't think it was AI generated. And given it is so simple to create it, you just need a phone and you just need to take a picture and come up with a prompt. That's it. Unlike the similar product that we got back in July, the new Samsung phones, the flip oh, right. yeah. Fold, those have a generation tool that you use with AI, but you have to draw an image into it yeah and i remember the boat they used in the demo was like a really well drawn yeah. boat i'm like i can't draw a boat that well i don't know if it's going to work for me yeah so I, I i drew a terrible looking boat but when it generated the images the boat was flying in the air and i'm using <laughs> this as an example for my uh -huh. next review so there's there's a difference there like you have to have a little bit of coordination with your artistry whenever you're drawing these pictures mine was pretty childish looking but i was still able to come up with some boats but with this case you don't even have to draw anything you just type it in you type mm -hmm. in an idea and it gives you a ton of different options so yes there is a slight difference there too it's it's fascinating how easy it is that i could 
instead of going into Photoshop nowadays, which I also know how to do, but it is very advanced. It's highly technical and it takes a long time. Now I just wait a few seconds for a generation tool to work on my phone and I can just text it to my mom. I do think this time is not that different though. And the reason I say that is there is always uh, the ability to fool at first, right? Uh, so for one thing, sending a picture of kittens is not something that raises suspicion. It would be like, right. oh, I guess maybe she got kittens. That seems a little weird, but it, you know, it's not harmful. So your, your, your suspicion level is, is on low alert. If you were to send a, you know, politically charged picture of something, then, you know, suddenly, uh, suspicions go, grow higher and the populace as a whole, which is what Sarah Jung is worried about. Not, not whether you fool your mom, but whether you can fool a large number of people, you know, that, that starts to to build up an immunity of is this faked we already have that because of photoshop and because of digital manipulation we we have that we will learn that for ai we are already starting to be suspicious and go i don't know that looks generated to me and eventually i probably would have noticed that your cat had two tails and been like <laughs> hold on a second uh so i I think we were, I, I liken it to high definition televisions. The, the first time you saw a high definition television, you probably thought it was like looking out a window. Now, you know, the difference where our eyes adjusted and we understand the imperfections we will get that way with generated images as well. And I don't think it will undermine full trust, but it will add a little bit of, of delay into trusting just a photo, which I think was already there. So I don't entirely disagree with Sarah Jung in that it is now undermined our trust in photos a little more, but we didn't have full trust in them anyway. And I don't think it will cause mass fooling. It will just make us a little more careful in trusting whether a photo is legitimate based on where it came from. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. I think that's a, a really good point to make. And I also did want to mention, I tried to type in when I was doing the plant photo, a pot with a plant. And uh -huh. I don't think it liked the word pot because that could oh. be deemed as something that is a particular illegal kind of plant. <laughs> you know, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So yeah, it, yeah. it didn't, it did not allow me to generate a picture with that specific word in hmm. it. So I, I had to come up with a different prompt when I was doing that. So there are certain things that you have to get around in yeah. order to use the AI tool. And that took a little bit of me just going, oh, I probably can't use that word because of the other connotation. There's some speed bumps. Not that you can't get there around There are speed stuff, bumps, but, but you can yeah. still do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it was a thought provoking article. Uh, so uh, good, good, good work, uh, Sarah Jung at The Verge for writing it. Uh, and I highly encourage everyone to go take a read and come up with your own opinion as well. Let's check out the mailbag. That's not the mailbag sound. That is the mailbag sound. Uh, we actually, in our mailbag, have a, a report from Dan Campos. Uh, but before we get to that, I wanted to thank everybody who gave us feedback on our Experiment Week shows last week. Uh, you guys loved the data science episode on Monday. Uh, we got great evaluations and, and fans of all the episodes that came in right on up to John Barger's uh, IT Enterprise, which I know a bunch of you were surprised to get one on Saturday. Saturday and to get one uh, on Enterprise IT. So uh, big thanks to everybody who submitted the shows and a big thanks to Roger Chang, who organized all of that. He was the traffic director. He was out there asking people to do this, cajoling them, getting them to send in uh, their episodes. So a uh, big thanks to Roger, big thanks to all of the contributors and a big thanks to you uh, for letting us have a little bit of a lighter week uh, in the middle of August and uh, give you some, some interesting shows to listen to as well. All right. Let's hear from Dan Campos from NTX. Uh, you might want to watch out if you get a Telegram message about a receipt. Uh, Tan has the details. Hello, friends at DTNS. A report by Kaspersky security researcher Leandro Cuaso reveals the rise in applications that generate phantom transfers and fake payment receipts. These applications are sold through Telegram groups where the APKs that simulate being banks, digital wallets, or services like Mercado Pago can be obtained. They allow users to acquire packages that generate a certain number of screenshots reflecting fake transfer receipts and can even send text messages that pretend to be sent by banks, confirming to the victim that a payment was made. 
This type of fraud has become more prevalent in countries like Argentina and Peru. For more details and Spanish lessons, come and visit Noticias de Tecnología Express. We have chips, salsa, and sometimes news. Back to you, amigos. Gracias, mi amigo. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and and uh, another interesting thing to be on the lookout for is the uh, the false receipt. I've I've seen this attempted in my in my in my emails, right? Ooh. But coming coming in messages, you know. That's another way to get at you. Uh, another way to prevent yourself from getting got at is to listen to Shannon Morse. Uh, what do you got going on these days, Shannon? Oh, I don't know. Oh, yes, I do. Uh, luckily, I unlisted the videos two days after I uploaded it. Oops, I have a video about Gemini AI. Now, there are a bunch of new settings that you have to make sure to set correctly when you set up your new Pixel phones that came out this summer. So click on this video, go through the new privacy settings for the new Pixel phones to just ensure that you have all your privacy and security settings set up correctly. Um, there are a few little tricky ones on there mm -hmm. when you first get your phone and you're going through those settings. So very, very important to check those out, especially if you're a little bit uh, adamant about not ha not using the AI tools on your new phone. Excellent, folks. Go check that out. And if you're a patron, stick around. There's still more show. Good day, Internet. Uh, one of Shannon's videos turned up in a database of videos on YouTube that were used to train an AI model. We're going to talk about whether we as creators are bothered by this or not. Stick around. You can also catch the show live on the internet, Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more about that by going to dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with more. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>